federal level, the Department of Agriculture and the Department of Interior both enforce different laws affecting tigers. There is no single government body responsible for tiger welfare. Well, we don't really know how many tigers are held captive in the United States. It's a very good question because estimates tend to go all over. Some say there's 5,000 cats in captivity, tigers. Some say there's up to 10. The problem with the numbering system is that the two federal agencies that are there to enforce our Endangered Species Act and the Animal Welfare Act don't know how many tigers are out there, which is very troubling because we need to get a handle on the number of cats. As hard as it is to imagine, big cats can be found everywhere, even on the fifth floor of an apartment building in the heart of New York City, like on an October day in 2003. This police video shows Ming, a full-grown 325-pound tiger, left home alone by its owner in Unit 5E of a Harlem apartment building. If the number and the location of big cats is a source for concern, a larger concern might just be the irresponsible owners. Screening for them remains difficult. In 2005, near the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library in Moore Park, a stunning example of human-tiger conflict occurred. I saw a tiger um, right there. Just real slow, huge, is about this high up to the fence. Newly retired George Gross was the incident commander at the California Fish and Game Department. For more than three weeks, he chased a tiger on the loose in a residential area. He got no help from the cat's owner, and on a February morning, he had a difficult decision to make. Basically, this was like a city living in fear for a month because somewhere there was this large tiger running around in their neighborhood. We didn't see it for quite a while, but we knew it was in here. So when it climbed out, it was like it came out of nowhere. All of a sudden, everybody could see it, and it started walking around quite slowly through the grass. You know, I was within 150 yards of it. You know, the first thing I thought was, like, what a majestic animal. This thing's beautiful. But then, you know, I came back in. It's like, uh, but I have this job to do, too. So it started walking towards me, and then it started going up a trail. I sat there and said, I can't have it up here on the soccer field, baseball field, and our opportunity to take a shot really diminishes. So that's when I gave the order for uh, people with rifles to, if they had a clean shot, to take the shot. The male tiger weighing as much as 600 pounds was taken from the hills near the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library by wildlife officials who say they had no choice but to kill it. I've always felt that I unfortunately made the right decision. And, you know, to be honest, is the first thing I did was pat him and say I was sorry. Because I knew I didn't want to kill him. George Gross was not the last law enforcement agent faced with such a decision. There was an even more dramatic incident on October 18, 2011 when there was a massive release of wild animals in Zanesville, Ohio. The owner of a private zoo threw open the gates of his facility before committing suicide. This time, it wasn't one tiger, but 18 on the loose. They were all killed by the authorities along with lions, bears, and monkeys. It probably will come to another tragedy before certain laws are either enforced like they should be or new laws are going to have to be implemented to have multiple situations happen because we're not moving on these issues is very tragic and it's very sad not only for the individuals but the cats that are involved because most of the time those cats are shot on site i'd rather see us be in a proactive mode versus a reactive mode is it time to ban the private ownership of tigers and other exotic animals? Twenty-six states banned the private ownership of tigers, but in many states, it's still legal to own and breed them, if you have a permit. Stories of tiger cubs sold at swap meets or on the internet are galvanizing the movement to ban private ownership of big cats. And in Washington, a political and legal battle is underway. People can't believe that these animals are still being born to be sold as pets. 
And you can get them for any amount of money, if you're foolish enough to pay. And when you see those little cubs, it, they're cute. But by the time they're seven months old, they are tearing up your house and taking a pretty good chunk out of you, because they don't have a 400-pound mom to say, knock it off, nor do they have any siblings with whom to play. So you become the sibling, and they're tough. As you're dealing with an apex predator, they are top of the food chain, one of four of the most dangerous animals in the world. And yet our government says that's okay, and uh, they will even give a permit to have these apex killers in somebody's backyard. It's very wrong. Tippi Hedren decided that something needed to be done and contacted her congressman. She successfully proposed a new law to prevent taking big cats across state lines, but this was just the beginning. So I took a, a bill to Washington in 2003. Uh, I was simply to stop these animals moving from one state to another. And um, uh, it took two years. It was called the title the Captive Wildlife Safety Act. It was sort of a precursor to the bill that I, I am ultimately, my goal is to have a bill that will stop the breeding of all of these animals to be sold as a pet or for financial gain. Tippi Hedren isn't alone in her quest to end the private ownership and breeding of tigers. Conservation organizations fear that the captive population of American tigers could contribute to the lucrative global trade in tiger parts for traditional medicines. For now, tiger farms in China and poaching are the main source of parts. So you have a state law, and we have 50 states, Banning breeding of tigers in captivity would be too problematic. And it's easier to make it a federal regulation than we don't have 50 different laws that could have as many different exemptions, so it's easier to do it at the federal level. The private ban is really focused on going after the individuals or these backyard breeders that are sort of out of the radar. Many private owners who have all their permits believe they have every right to keep Tigers. Well, the possibility of a federal ban would be a nightmare. There are more and more and more restrictions all the time. All the time. More and more regulations and more and more restrictions. You, you have to, again, you have to be organized. You have to have lobbyists. Um, you have to present your side of it to the right people. It's a political thing. It's a money thing. The organizations pushing for the ban are also concerned about tiger welfare, even fed standards of care. A three by three meter cage is the minimum requirement. Tammy Tees manages the Wildcat Sanctuary in Minnesota. She has heard countless stories of abused animals and careless owners. Most of the animals, including the tigers at the sanctuary, come from people who think a tiger would make a good pet. We hear all the stories. It got aggressive. It turned on me. I can't find vet care. I lost my homeowner's insurance. Um, you know, I didn't know it'd get this big. I didn't know it'd eat this much. And we tell people a wild animal is not a pet, and it never should be kept as one. Titan behind me, that tiger was illegally owned and should have been seized under the state law. Had he have been seized prior to that, um, his owner would still be alive today. Stopping people from acquiring and breeding tigers motivates animal rights defenders and conservationists, but private breeders defend their practice by saying that if tigers were to go extinct in the wild, it would be better to have captive tigers than none at all. This view is highly controversial. My question is, if you ban these animals, we can no longer keep and breed them, so it will be, they will be extinct in captivity. Now they go extinct in the wild. What have you accomplished? You killed the species.
a ban on breeding or keeping tigers. While the United States looks to control unregulated breeding of tigers by private owners, across the world, extraordinary efforts are being made to save tigers in the wild. For Ron Tilson, zoo tigers represent a backup for the wild population. He has been the coordinator of the Tiger Species Survival Plan, designed to maintain healthy and genetically diverse tigers. In the zoo world, we try and have what we call a hands-off management. That means let's not touch tigers, let's not play with tigers, let's consider them really quite dangerous. For the longest time, I refused to even call a tiger by a name. I'm not particularly fond of house names. <clears throat> to me, they're numbers. Um, they're a stud book number, and I see a tiger more as a collection of genes. <clears throat> and what I'm concerned about is the future way down the line that these animals still maintain their tigerness. Scientists have divided tigers into nine subspecies. Three of them have already gone extinct. The Bali tiger in the 1940s, the Caspian tiger in the 1970s, and the Javan tiger in the 1980s. Surviving are the Siberian or Amur tiger, the Bengal, the Indo-Chinese, the Malayan, and the Sumatran tigers. They are all endangered. And the last South China tigers can only be found in captivity. We know every tiger in the North American zoos, and we know its lineage. We know every parent, grandparent, great-grandparent, great-great-grandparent, all the way back to its wild-caught mother and father. So we know exactly where they came from in Russia for the Amur tigers, and we know who they mated with and who their offspring. So we have these like giant family trees. Unlike most zoos, most private owners don't know the lineage of their tigers because no one has kept track of their pedigrees. Yeah, there you go, Elvis. Tigers from different subspecies resemble each other and most breeders aren't interested in keeping subspecies pure. As for subspecies, I, I don't believe in them. I don't care. And so, some of them might have more Bengal blood in them because some of them don't actually grow the big, thick fur in winter. Some of them do, so I know they have a lot of Siberian blood with them. The white tiger is the best example of breeding for looks. Loved for its striking appearance, it's not a subspecies, but a color morph. The result of a recessive gene that causes one in every 10,000 tigers to be born white. White tigers are almost non-existent in the wild, but they are often bred in captivity. This has made them highly inbred and more susceptible to health problems. And that's not the only consequence of private ownership. People notice that many tigers in captivity might be bigger than in a wild, because in a wild you need to stay athletic to catch prey. In captivity, they get their food served, basically on a silver platter. And one of the reasons many tigers in captivity are huge, they are simply fat, they are obese, not good for their liver. A lot of the stuff American tigers are fed, it's basically stuff we eat, it's from supermarket. Some of the meat, might have some hormones in them. The other theory is some breeders might selectively breed for bigger size because it looks impressive on display. Huge tiger, it looks more impressive than small tiger. Might be simply because they just don't exercise as much as the ones in the wild. Because any cat, even in the wild, if they don't have to move, they don't move, they sleep. The scientific community has labeled these tigers as generic, 